Hi, this is Ginger, and I just want to thank all of you for participating in today's panel. We had, I wanted to make sure everyone could get on, and um, Look Magazine and Elaine and Katie have been generously serving as our media partner. They set up the whole platform, which is awesome. Um, but d does everyone want to go around and introduce yourself before the panel begins, like just to each other, or have you all kind of figured out who each other are? Probably a hybrid. I, oh, I'll, I'll start. I'm Elaine Ubina, and I'm a co-founder of Fairfield County Look with my husband. Uh, we are an events-based platform. We generally photograph events and put them out to the world. Um, we've had to take a big switch in what we do, and we've been having fun with it. We're entrepreneurs at heart, so it's been, uh, it's been interesting and fun. I'm delighted to have you guys here. Andrew, you want to go next? Uh, hi, Andrew Carpin. Uh, I'm, I'm CEO of a company called Bleecker Street, uh, which is a film production and distribution company uh, out of New York, or hopefully back in New York. Um, that's kind of who I am. And a gift board member, valued gift oh, board member. Yes. I'm a board member of Gift. And so is Darnell. So Darnell, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Darnell Strom. Uh, I'm an agent at uh, United Talent Agency, which we now just call ourselves UTA. Um, and uh, I run our arts and culture division. So really work with a number of, you know, kind of our big clients uh, across um, TV, film, uh, music, uh, sports. Um, so I really have a, a cross section of the, of the agency in my, uh, in my purview. So. Brent, do you want to say sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Ginger, um, and look for sponsoring. Uh, I, we are, my company's Wheelhouse. Uh, we have uh, offices in West Hollywood, Tribeca, and thanks to, to George, we're building out uh, much bigger offices in Stanford, Connecticut, um, and uh, excited to, to be on this panel. Um, Darnell is one of my, what I call, COVID friends who I've got to meet <laughs> during COVID, so excited to see some familiar faces and meet some new faces as well. And Adam, if you wanna. Yeah, hi, I'm Adam Newhouse. I'm a director of development at ESPN. So I help lead development for the 30 for 30 series and ESPN films on the films and the podcast. And then in addition, ESPN plus and all the original content for, for that. And I've spent whole career in New York and I'm now decamped in, uh, in North Carolina. And, and um, Talia, am I saying your name right? Atalia, I think you're on mute. I think you're on mute. I should have figured this out by now, right? It's been three months. Um, Athalia, it's a soft th. Hi, everybody. So I um, run a production company out of New York and LA, Brooklyn, and LA. I haven't been in Brooklyn for maybe I don't know since March of this point, maybe even February. Um, <laughs> I am parked in Southern California because I too like to get, get out of New York, <laughs> especially when things go down. Um, I used to be executive creative, creative director at Vice for almost a decade and started the front a few years ago to really represent women's voices and um, in general underrepresented voices and have been recently working on some Quibi shows and a Netflix show, um, documentaries is our focus. So good to meet everybody. I know Adam, we've met before. Good. And George, you want to mm -hmm. say something? This is just unofficially so we can connect and then we'll yeah. formally begin. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, everybody. George Norfleet. Uh, I'm the director of the Connecticut Office of Film, Television, and Digital Media. Um, so I'm the film connect, film commissioner for uh, the state of Connecticut. Uh, most of you guys are have worked with folks like myself in other jurisdictions. I wish you'd come work with me more. Um, we'll see what we can do about that. And uh, huge fans of GIF. We are we're regular sponsors of GIF since I think the beginning, and just uh, looking forward to having you know an interesting panel discussion with you guys and uh, and like that. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Elaine Ubina, and I'm the co-founder of Fairfield County Look, 
We, um, many of you know us, we're an entertainment platform with uh, events, parties, benefits, and now look Zooms, and this is one of them. Uh, wanted to thank you all for coming, and we have almost 100 people on today, so we're really excited about that and thrilled with this very vibrant panel. Um, I wanted to introduce Ginger Stickle, the Executive Director of the Greenwich Film Festival, our partners, and we love working with you guys and thrilled to, to have this opportunity. So I'll let Ginger take it from here. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you to Katie and the whole Fairfield County Look team uh, for serving as our media partner on What's Next in Entertainment. Um, on behalf of Wendy Stapleton and Colleen DeVere um, and myself, I'd like to thank the Connecticut Office of Film, Television, and Digital Media for sponsoring the panel and uh, the Greenwich International Film Festival. We've had a long-standing relationship with both of these organizations who've supported our work for many years, so thank you. Um, a little bit of background, Greenwich International Film Festival was launched seven years ago to provide an effective platform for filmmakers and artists to expose their work. Since the beginning of 2020, we've seen dramatic changes in the landscape of film and media. For the first time ever, we moved to a virtual platform to host our annual film festival and found considerable success with it. Therefore, we thought it would be timely to organize a panel of industry leaders to discuss how recent changes have affected the entertainment industry overall. We are honored to have incredible representatives from production companies, distribution companies, agencies, and networks here with us today. Without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce the moderator, George Norfleet. George is the talented director of the Connecticut Office of Film, Television, and Digital Media. He oversees all of the office's programs and operations and focuses state resources on marketing Connecticut as a prime destination for film, television, entertainment, and digital media. Um, this is to help companies conduct production operations or establish a locus in the state from which to do business. George is also a member of the Connecticut Public Media's Board of Trustees. He began his career in advertising before moving into commercial and feature film production. He's worked on films and television shows helmed by many of Hollywood's top directors and producers. Uh, he's also consulted on tax, finance, and production structures for a variety of productions and spoken on tax incentives at symposiums, seminars, and conferences across the country. Uh, he's an impressive person, and we're glad to have him here with us. So thank you, George. Uh, thank you, Ginger. You were, that was me? That was you. It, it sounds good. Um, thank you so much for that introduction and um, let me uh, sort of take the standard and um, introduce the balance of the panel. Um, we'll start with Thalia Mavros, who is CEO at The Front. Thalia is an award-winning filmmaker, director, and media executive turned entrepreneur. She is the founder and CEO of The Front, a documentary production studio with an interest on innovative storytelling that addresses injustices of every kind, with premieres at Tribeca Con, South by Southwest, and LAFF. She's won multiple awards along the way, including numerous Webbies, Ad Weeks, Changing the Game, Ad Weeks, Changing the Game Award, and Audience Awards at the LA Film Festival. <clears throat> and more Orleans. Everybody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> are you, it's always are you telling me you want me awkward. to stop, <laughs> Yes, thank you. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's just always hard to listen to these things sometimes. But um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this wonderful group that you assembled. And we are happy to have you. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Andrew Carpin, who is the CEO at Bleecker Street. Uh, he's also an executive producer, um, and an independently, which is, uh, Bleecker Street is an independently financed distribution company based in New York City, for those of you who aren't aware. Um, and Mr. Carpenter's company has a string of successful releases such as Deborah Granick's Leave No Trace, Steven Soderbergh's Logan Lucky, uh, Disobedience starring Rachel Weiss and Rachel McAdams, the Academy Award nominated Captain Fantastic, uh, the hit thriller Eye in the Sky, 
I'll See You in My Dream, starring Blythe Danner and Sam Elliott, and the Academy Award-nominated Trumbo. Just watched that the other day, Mr. Mr. Carpenter. It's a fabulous film. Uh, recent releases include The Assistant, directed by Kitty Green, Hotel Mumbai with Dev Patel and Arnie Hammer, Military Wives, starring Kristen Scott Thomas and Sharon Horgan, and The Art of Self-Defense with Jesse Eisenberg. Uh, Mr. Carpenter's upcoming films include the Sundance End of the World comedy Save Yourselves, The Secrets We Keep with Numi Rapace, Joel Kinnaman and Chris Messina, Dream Horse starring Tony Collette and Damian Lewis, and Wild Mountain Time with Emily Blunt, Jamie Dornan, John Hamm, and Christopher Walken. Quite, quite, quite an impressive list there, Mr. Carpenter. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to join the conversation. Next, would like to introduce um, Mr. Darnell Strom, who is the head of culture and leadership division at UTA and also a graduate of the Florida A&M University. I went to school right down the street at Florida State. Good to see you, my fellow uh, ex-Floridian. <laughs> Darnell is, uh, works at UTA, as he had mentioned previously. Um, he has worked as an agent at uh, leading entertainment and sports agency uh, CAA, where he developed relationships with prospective clients for CAA and helped build their strategy for developing a vibrant platform across speaking, books, television, motion picture, technology, and digital. Prior to this, Mr. Strong served as a strategic advisor to actors, writers, directors, music artists, athletes, executives, and corporations on their philanthropic and pro-social initiatives. Mr. Strong began his career in politics, interestingly, nonprofit work, and social entrepreneurship. He served as the director of the chair's office of the 2004 Democratic National Convention, where he focused on political outreach to core Democratic constituency groups. At the conclusion of the Democratic Convention, Mr. Strom was named the floor director of operations for John Kerry's presidential campaign, making him one of the youngest senior staff members of the campaign in a battleground state. As I mentioned, Mr. Strom has graduated with honors from Florida A&M University in political science and has been a presenter at a number of conferences including the Aspen Ideas Festival, Clinton Global Initiative University, and the UN's Nexus Global Youth Summit. Importantly, Mr. Strom has also served on President Obama's White House Entertainment Council, as well as GQ Gentlemen's Fund Advisory Committee, and he hails from San Jose, California, and currently resides in Los Angeles. Thank you for joining That's us, enough. Mr. Strom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for being with us. Appreciate it very much. Um, next, we're going to go to you, Brent, Mr. Brent Montgomery, who is the CEO of Wheelhouse Entertainment. Uh, and Brent uh, has uh, been involved in media with, with, a, with a huge empire, stemming from his roots as an award winning producer and entrepreneur. He currently serves as CEO of Wheelhouse Group, which is a web of content creators, celebrity talent, and athletes, including superstars such as Odell Beckham Jr., Steve Curry. Carmelo Anthony, as well as comedian, actor, and producer, and digital entrepreneur, Kevin Hart. Uh, these folks collectively act as an amplifier for Wheelhouse Partners, the company's investing arm, which works in concert with venture and PE companies. Um, and we're very much looking forward to having Brent's company open up a very sprawling empire or outpost, outpost of his empire here in Stanford, Connecticut. So thank you, Mr. Montgomery, for joining us. Thank you, George, for uh, having us and uh, working with us to have a big presence here in Connecticut. Excited uh, to be an eight minute commute from my office for once in my life. <laughs> Glad you're here. Next, we're gonna go to um, Adam Newhouse. I hope I said that right, Newhouse from ESPN. He's the director of development there. Uh, as well as at ESPN Plus. He primarily works on the award-winning 30 for 30 documentary series there, which across the feature films, shorts, uh, as well as podcast series. In addition, Adam leads creative development for original content on the streaming service, ESPN Plus. Adam has worked as a creative producer across film, television, digital, and branded content, including work via his ideation company, No House Ideas. Adam was head of development for the production studio Radical Media, working on digital documentaries and television prior to that. Adam has served 
on the board of directors and currently serves on the advisory board for the Ghetto Film School. And additionally, Adam is on the board of directors at the Bushwick Film Institute, the advisory board of the uh, IFP New York and is co-president of New York Court of the Arts. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, thanks for having me. Okay, who did I leave out? I don't think I left out anyone. So um, let's go ahead and, and get started uh, with some sort of, you know, background information. Um, Ginger came to me uh, with, the, with the concept for what's next in filmmaking panel, conquering a changing landscape. And I just thought it was very appro apropos, uh, especially for any panel this year, but definitely this year. Uh, 2020, the year of our Lord 2020 has indeed been a year of, um, I would say, uh, landscape changing events. It, is, it has been a year of years um, in many ways, starting with just folks being concerned about sort of the condition of our planet, then uh, moving into, unfortunately, you know, a viral pandemic, um, and then to an awakening to, an, to racial injustices that is spread around the world. I don't think anyone could have ever foreseen some of these major sort of tectonic shifts that, that we are living through uh, right now. So um, I think it's extremely important that we're having a panel with these types of folks to talk about sort of some of the things that are uh, that are impacting us around the world and here uh, in America and more specifically in um, the film, television and digital media uh, sector. So um, I would like to say that as we move forward, understanding that this, this year has been as impactful as it's been, I, I don't think that anyone would expect that um, things will be the same again, but I'd like to sort of invoke, um, to quote Governor Cuomo, uh, that if we're going to go through something that's like this, let's learn from it and come out on the other side better than we were when we started. So um, hopefully when this, when this panel is complete, you might feel the same way, that you're, you've been exposed to something that you did not know and, and, and you've been edified and you're a little bit better off uh, when, we, when we get out on the other side. So first, I want to just sort of answer, uh, ask rather some questions broadly for everyone to sort of um, to pick up. Um, starting on 2020, um, what are some of the challenges you faced in 2020 and, and or what have you learned in the past six years? And um, I guess we could start with um, uh, Thalia. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the biggest question, right? Um, as you mentioned, pandemics, uprisings, um, seismic shifts that needed to happen and some that didn't need to happen in terms of the pandemic. But um, <clears throat> I think for, for us, it's been, you know, production is a hard business already to be in, in, in terms of um, always expect the unexpected. And then all of a sudden, when you have like on um, a social and global level, more, more things to be uh, to respond to. Um, you know, we're trained for it to a certain degree. I think if you look at any industry, we're probably the best trained for like Murphy's Law. If it's something to go wrong, how do we deal with it? And I've been very impressed really about how um, the whole industry has been really responsible and responsive um, to everything. I think it's, it's been uncharted territory. You know, it's, it's not, it's, there's no easy answer. For a small company like ours, you know, we had a few major deals fall through because we weren't able to go out and shoot this year. Um, and, you know, we've had, and we've, thankfully, we also were able to deliver some projects. We delivered a Quibi project remotely. Um, we were set up for bi-coastal, so it was easier for us. Um, but, and we're right now in development on a, on a, a big project. So, to a certain degree, everything else kind of fell into place, but I think it's what is expected of us as producers, as business owners, as an industry in general is kind of really demanding at this point. And um, so, you know, I don't know that I have an easy answer here. Like, what have we learned? We've learned to weather um, the much bigger storms than we expected. We've um, 
to work together as an industry with our buyers, with other production companies, um, to be able to, to try and, and navigate this new reality, um, project-wise and financially. Um, we've learned and, you know, we've had this, all of us, and to step up and really look at our, our hiring practices, um, how we're, you know, how we're staffing up, who we're staffing up with, which is something that we've always really done at the front and started the company based on that premise. But um, what can we do better? How can we be better? How can we also help bring change into the world that's necessary? Those are huge lessons. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can really give like a simple answer. It, they're very complicated, but also it's been such a, a time for growth and and deep, deep conversations amongst the people in the industry that I really appreciated. Right on. Insightful. Thank you. Greg, how about you? What would you say were some of the biggest challenges you encountered uh, or are in the process of encountering? Yeah, it's it's been, uh, you know, I, I keep quoting Tale of Two Cities, the best of times, worst of times. Um, you know, as, as a producer and as a parent, I, I think we often want to solve things, you know, as quickly as possible. And, you know, what I, I've learned, and I'm sure everybody on the phone is, has learned is, you know, this is, these are issues that uh, one hopefully has an expiration date on it of, you know, the next 12 to 18 or maybe even faster in, in finding a vaccination. Um, and I think the other one uh, is, is much more complicated. It will have a longer, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it will require a much longer uh, syst systemic rebooting of, of every industry, almost every industry. Um, for, for me, it was quite fascinating. There was like this halfway point to where we are right now where, um, you know, just when we thought we were out of uh, uh, the worst part of the pandemic, uh, you know, the tragedy uh, with George Floyd happened. And, you know, I think everybody's immediate response was, you know, if, if you're black, um, you, you're, you're sort of probably a little bit frustrated that it took, you know, the umpteenth one of these to, to garner the attention. If it wasn't for a cell phone, it wouldn't have happened. So at that moment, I started really, you know, doing what I think, um, what I thought at least was the right thing, which was just start listening to a lot smarter people. And I found myself on a, on a, on a Zoom like this with 100 people um, where, uh, three black, um, you know, really instrumental leaders uh, of different industries have been brought in to speak about it. And it kind of was an epiphany for me in that, you know, our first focus with our business during the pandemic, because we had a, you know, a universal shutdown of, um, you know, dozens of TV and film projects. And, and it, went, it meant we as a senior team went back to the drawing board for how do we rebuild this business for coming out and Think, you know, we went in thinking it was a six to eight week, uh, uh, you know, problem, which we all know now looking back is silly. Um, and and what, I, what I came inspired from that call was if, if maybe without a pandemic, maybe all of us, I think we heard earlier uh, in the pre-call, maybe we're not all on this phone call. Maybe we're all not on these calls that are calling for social impact. The hundred people that I found on this phone would have never been together in the real world. They would have never been looking um, and thinking that we can make systemic change if we all sign up to do more and talk less um, than if we had the, the, hor the horrific things that had happened, but on top of a pandemic. You know, I think the pandemic taught us to, to basically forget a lot of the things that we just accepted. Um, working from home, that was something that nobody really garnered any traction as an employer. I was always wondering if people would actually do it. I think probably the, the, the other people on this panel would say their, their staffs have done it and probably done it better. Um, I think, like we were joking, a lot of the parents want to be back in the office. Um, but so anyway, a long-winded answer. I agree that it's not a, there's not a simple answer. These are complex issues. And I think having conversations around them uh, is, the, is a starting point, but it, it has to be really conversations that are followed up with action plans. Thank you. Um, Darnell, would you like to chime in on 
it, it occurs to me, and I keep talking about 2020 because it's just been so chock full of intense stuff, but it's only June. You know? Know. <laughs> but, We're only uh, halfway <laughs> done, which is sad or just scary. <laughs> well, I would say July. I'm going to say July. <laughs> it is the 22nd. Yeah, it'll, it'll, I hear July is going to be a great month. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, think, I think talent agencies are a, a, an interesting thermometer of the overall industry because we work across every sector from TV to film to sports to music to live events to, to all of it. So, you know, I think one of the things that we learned is that I, didn't, I don't think we were really paying attention to how much of our business, um, you know, depends on people, people being able to gather in person. Um, and whether that is being able to physically produce content, whether that is to go to a sporting event or to a concert or a festival or a conference, so much of the business is, has been based around, uh, around gathering in person. Um, so, you know, we've had, I think, all the whole industry and all of the agencies have had challenges. And I think, you know, we're thinking about not being over leveraged in, in, in one area. And I think the folks who are spending a lot of time on the in the in the music touring space, the comedy touring space have probably had more of a challenging time. I think also two folks who are, haven't been able to uh, to produce. But I think something else that we've learned coming out of this is just, you know, how resilient as an agency that we are, like shifting models in real time to be able to find opportunity. Um, I think that people still want content. Uh, people still want to find ways to connect. I think that oftentimes people before resisted virtual connections. And, you know, I think we've learned that, look, virtual isn't perfect and it isn't the same thing, but it is giving folks what, what they want. So we've been creative to find opportunities, whether they be through music or through comedy or, or otherwise uh, through, through virtual. And I think the biggest takeaway is how do we move past all of what's going on with, with COVID address you know whatever this next year transition point will be who knows how how long this is going to last and hopefully it's less time than than more but on the other end of this how do we become a better stronger business that doesn't have maybe the same blind spots that's maybe diversified from a business perspective um and then you know and i think we're gonna we'll talk about um you know, all of the racial uh, injustice and unrest that's, that's happening in the country that's been a real reckoning, not only in social and civic culture, but throughout corporate culture and how we're thinking about changing the way that we do business and who's in the room and who's represented and, and you know, and who's, in, who's included. I mean, that is a big piece of what's coming out of this anyway. I think that there's been efforts going on in Hollywood for a very long, for a very long time, I think even more recently within the last few years, to push that. But just like COVID has accelerated some of the changes in our business that were probably needed to happen um, and making them happen quicker, uh, I think what happened post George Floyd is accelerating a lot of these things that needed to happen and making them happen much quicker. And you know, to your point, uh, I think I'm not sure if it was George who said this or, or, or Brent is like on the on the other side of this, making sure that we are we are better off than we were from the from, from the beginning. Thank you. Strong statement. I, I kind of would like everybody to have a bite at this apple because it is um, really sort of uh, central to this conversation and to all of our lives right now. So Andrew, um, how about you? What would you say have been some of the things that have uh, uh, been a challenge or um, come to the fore thus far this year? Well, I mean, obviously as a theatrical distribution company, which is what, what the basis of what we, we do, um, the change that happened um, literally right when I was releasing a film to the next film uh, coming out at the end of March, we had to adjust you know, extremely quickly to look at how, how we could do things differently. Um, and I think some of the things that, that for me were, were interesting was not only seeing how quickly my team could adjust and do things, but also as the independent side of the business, um, the dialogue that started to happen with some of the other independent distributors on how we could do things differently. For example, um, I think many of you hopefully are aware, um, some of the independent distributors started doing what was called virtual cinema, which was connecting with local theaters that were shut down and doing through a virtual way that we could stream our movies and share the revenue with theaters, with organizations like GIF, because we were going to have a film play with GIF. So it was really interesting for me to see how quickly um, different groups could adjust, 
but also work together. Um, you know, we have to look at how we're doing things right now, and hopefully theaters will open in July. That's what they're saying. But, you know, we've, we had a film that we had to adjust. We did a deal with Hulu on one of our films because the audience makeup of who we thought who was going to see the film. Were they really the right people to come back um, early on? But it is this, this quickly changing landscape of how consumers are going to consume content and how, I agree, there's still an appetite for content, how we're going to deliver it both individually as a company, but working with uh, some of our other uh, partners out there, as well as you know, changing the kind of content we create so, uh, for, for all audiences. So as, as difficult as it has been, it has been interesting to see how we've been able to adapt uh, as an industry. Hmm. Adjust, adapt, work together. Yeah, thanks. Um, Adam? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in on that. I mean, certainly it's been uh, a privilege to kind of have a peek inside the machine that is ESPN. You know, a business certainly whose business is entirely predicated on live sports and just to see how people have come together, how people have reassessed all their work processes. Um, you know, our remote production team has done, you know, some of the best work uh, across the board. And it's been, you know, again, expected and unexpected things to happen. You know, on one hand, you know, you could see without live sports, the hunger for it. So, you know, the NFL draft, which is, if you really break it down, the unveiling of a list, you know, is now turned into a three day event. Ratings were up 40% over the year before. So a massive hit, you know, with the lack of live sports, we were able to coalesce what was already going to be tremendous interest in something like the last dance um, documentary series, but with nothing. Doing that. That was amazing. We yeah. needed it. That was great. <laughs> there you go. I mean, so that's the thing. It was supposed to air on the off nights of the NBA finals. So it was going to have a huge audience regardless. People were hungry for Jordan content, et cetera. But because there was a lack of stuff, we were able to kind of integrate across the entire company. I've never seen a company pull together for a single piece of content in that way. The amount of things that were done to draw interest in that. So whether it was the draft, you know, we also had the WNBA draft, the MLB draft, all those numbers are above and beyond. I think within two months of the pandemic, ESPN had over 10 hours of live programming every day going, you know, certainly as sports, uh, whether, whether it was part of the pandemic or even now showing the leadership and being really the drivers of lots of the um, racial injustice conversation that's happening across the company. So we saw lots of th those types of things happen um, and in addition, you know, now as live sports are coming back, you know, it's proving to be a litmus test for everything else, you know, and can we gather in person? And so watching how those conversations are conducted, how the, um, you know, the legal and the safety protocols and just the amount of detail that goes into all these things that we took, um, in, you know, that we took, took for granted. I think overall uh, this time period has been an opportunity for all businesses to reassess how we're doing business, how we want to do business moving forward. And in some ways, I, I think the conversation about racial injustice, I think it's so important that it's happening right now. In some ways, the pandemic and having everybody at home in a way or paused in general has added fuel to something that has needed you know, more fuel across the board. Wow, thank you. Um... I know it wasn't a documentary film at all, but I'm curious, Thalia, uh, of your take, since we're kind of headed in that direction, of your take on the tragic murder of George Floyd and the use of cameras, cell phone cameras, security cameras, body cams, uh, to capture and to tell the truth of his last moments. Um, do you have any ideas how documentary filmmaking might be used also to assist um, racial the racial injustice uh, uh, movement that's currently underway? That's an excellent question. I mean, you know, there's the the meme that goes, that's go, that's been going around the internet that, you know, racism isn't something new, it's just being filmed for the first time now. And I think really nothing has rung truer. Um, when I, you know, I, I grew up in Greece and moved to the United States at a fairly older after college, and it was a, and it was interesting to see 
the shifts from that. And I actually lived down south for a while, which is a whole other different interesting experience. And then seeing now and the conversations that are happening in a public in a global on a global scale that were all happening behind closed doors at the time and how that has been really facilitated by um, everybody carrying a camera with them is such a strong such a powerful um, I mean it took a long time and just did it but it's such a powerful medium film is, has always for I think for me have been such a powerful medium to be able to tell a story in documentary filmmaking very much so I think now we all share in the responsibility of what are we filming and what are we putting online and how are we telling a story around it so in a lot of ways it's like the you know the the capital D in documentary I'm not sure exists in the way that it did before because now in a lot in, in so many ways we've all become somewhat we have this distributed um, network of filmmaking that is our cell phones and that is social media and I think that's really changed the notion and, and people have gotten so much closer to documentaries now and understanding the power of being able to tell the story behind the image that I think it's, it's, it's a really exciting, exciting. It's a really, it's a time, you know, I like to, I love to call it an uprising and I love to call it, you know, a seismic shift because I think it's a time where we can collectively, and it's not just filmmakers. I think the public understands how to gather a lot of this film, a lot of this, the, the, the documentation to be able to contribute it to a larger cause. And then on the other side of it, have people that can also take that footage, take that information and help craft a larger story. I, you know, it's, it's unprecedented, but also um, it's a time for everybody to step up in such an exciting way. Um, and our role now as documentarian becomes a lot, a lot more, a lot more important. And um, I, you know, and I think a distributed network of documentarians is kind of an exciting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. You know, look at what Sean King has been doing in terms of the gathering information and redistributing it. Look at like, it's, it's helped people have a vocabulary around what's going on that allows us to create change. You know, it happened with the Me Too movement. Now it's happening with Black Lives Matter. We didn't have vocabularies and nobody was listening to the vocabulary that people were trying, the conversations that were trying to be had. And now finally there, you know, this has been created in a, I think the, you know, with the death of George Floyd and so many deaths, it's not just George Floyd, obviously that was just the tipping point. Um, now being able to have that filmed and have things or, or the police brutality or what's going on in the streets day to day, there's like a document to show. It, it was interesting, like being able to take people through of like, here's exactly what's going on. How are we going to have a conversation about this in a way that's immediate, that's powerful and that's human, right? So, you know, if I step back from me as a, as a citizen and, uh, and into you know a person in the industry and what we're going to do with that i think um you know that's the right now the the biggest question and the biggest conversations that we're having it's like now there's this big explosion that's happened of information of conversation how do we enable the people that need to tell the stories to be able to tell these stories how do we gather help them gather how do we find financing, platforms, distribution to be able to tell the best story possible. So, I mean, there's, I think, depending on the, the point of view that we're looking at it, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot to be done. And I think it's, I love to feel that, that, you know, the palpitation, that energy of like, how do we, and how do we sustain that, right? It's happening right now, but how do we create the change that needs to happen? How do we make sure this isn't like the next, the blip that then everybody moves on to whatever the next big thing is? And I think 
it's a pow- it's powerful right now. And documentary is a, is a big piece of what's about to happen, how it's about to move, you know? So well, thank goodness we don't have, thank goodness we have digital now. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> how much worse it was? Now it's very democratic. I mean, we're all walking around with one of these. Um, I mean, it's still really difficult to find financing, but um, yeah, it's that's. I think that's a really good point that you made. I was just gonna, Thank you. Go ahead, Brent. Uh, I had a conversation with Darnell a couple weeks ago, and just, you know, just getting into how do we listen, but then also activate some ideas. And he said something interesting around there being a lot of um, a lot of great uh, accomplishment for for um, the gay movement through entertainment. And, you know, I was um, involved in the, the reboot of, of Netflix's Queer Eye, which the first time around, it was kind of like busting into the party. And now the, the show was more about, all right, we're here at the party, what do, what do we have to say? And, and, and the fact that, you know, entertainment helped move the gay cause, you know, forward by light years, by being at, at the forefront of culture and, and having those voices and, and doing something very similar to uh, to what needs to be done now um, with with Black Lives Matter and a couple like specific um, cases in point I thought there there's a great going back to your initial question George there's a great documentary called Game Changers on plant based food and what I thought was as a guy who grew up in Texas and puts barbecue up there at the highest <laughs> levels of everything. Um, I, I would say to go in as a skeptic was a light statement, but I came out really uh, having a complete 180 and, and everything I thought because of who they chose to tell the story. And it wasn't like the old school Moby and people who were at the, the tip of it, but it was the strongest guy in the world, right? It was the best athletes in the world. We're seeing Chris Paul and other, you know, um, super intelligent, incredible athletes changing their their entire diets. And I thought that documentary did an insane amount to for that cause. I think um, Super Size Me back in the day really called out the fast food industry. And I think, you know, building off of what Italia said, it's really what what is the George Floyd story and what's the macro story? And is it is it is it just a black person telling the story or is it some unexpected voices to go in and, and really see it from, from all angles to, to really convince the people who are the furthest away from it right now and believing it. Um, I, think, I think documentary, uh, you know, films are great and films take a long time to get made. Um, and, and there's a chance that we're probably already sitting on the footage we need to tell stories that'll make an impact on, on, on this. I'll, I'll just want to jump in and say, like, you know, I've, I've been very bullish on, on documentaries for, for a while. And, you know, I think for better or worse and, and probably worse, like, you know, the, the, the media and the news has kind of shifted what they actually focus on. So gone are the days of true long form journalism, investigative journalism. And it's here's the highlight of the day. Here's the thing that's going to be the most salacious. This is a thing that is going to keep your attention for a second. And so documentaries have become our kind of last bastion of true long form investigative, you know, kind of deeper dive storytelling. And, you know, to, you know, Brent, you talked about Game Changers. Um, my wife got a cut of it two years ago of, of the film because my wife worked in the documentary film world. And so I'm vegan and it's because of that film. And I think it's who's telling certain stories to, to reach you. So that film, every, every vegan man that I talked to who were, you know, proudly carnivorous before, when they saw high performing athletes who are the people that they look up to oftentimes changing um, their, their diet and, and it helping their performance, then it kind of made men think about it in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way, not just men, women too, but I think it really kind of spoke to, to, to men that way. But look, I think that documentaries are, are so important to, you know, telling stories, going deeper. And if you look at the conversations that are happening, like the, the you know, the old water cooler talk, like at, at work now, like what's, what, what is, what's the content that's really driving conversation now? It's not just, you know, your favorite scripted show, but it's like, it's documentaries because people, one, like to be connected to what's something that is real and people are, are learning from it. We just, uh, we just announced um, last week that, you know, uh, we did a deal uh, for this documentary around voting rights uh, with Stacey Abrams and, you know, Liz Garbus, who's a 
two-time Academy Award uh, nominee and uh, Lisa Cortez to talk about like kind of the history of voter suppression in, in the United States. Like how did it start off? How is it manifesting itself, itself today? And, you know, it went into a, a pretty competitive bidding war because I think people are like, these issues that are timely, there's no better way to really do a deep dive and get people engaged into changing them than, than documentary film. You know, I think, I think scripted narrative films are great, but you know, I think documentaries really get to the core of connect people and there's a real conversation that hopefully comes around them. And you can also drive up these audience engagement campaigns uh, to stack on top of the documentary. So you really kind of force people to have the, have the conversation afterwards. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of documentaries and I think that they're only gonna grow and you know, putting on my agent hat the viability of the business has gotten so much better and is going to uh, in, increase. And I think with, and I think the streaming services have, have made it so. I mean, everyone's looking for content right now. And I think you see that it doesn't cost as much money to make a documentary or a docu-series, um, but it is, it's having these high level of, levels of engagement um, that series that are costing you a ton of money uh, to make. So the economics on it are, are great too. You know, just to expand on Darnell's point, um, GIF is a social impact film festival, but over the years, we do an audience survey every year, and it's become more and more apparent how much our audience relies on the festival to, you know, to watch some of the best documentaries, and that, in this year's survey, had the highest rating of any, you know, genre of film that we show uh, through the film festival. Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right, Darnell. I think people have become more and more interested in documentaries and rely on them for real information and to kind of enlighten themselves on on different um, issues facing the world. Um, in fact. Back in March, and this seems so long ago, um, we were working on a Spotlight On event with one of uh, the filmmakers who's from this area that that uh, we think very highly of, Matthew Heineman, and he was going out into the field at the start of this pandemic in the United States um, to film the frontline workers at one of the hospitals. And so, you know, it's interesting, but he he was, you know, kind of furiously throwing himself in that project right at the beginning. So. I think we'll start to see pretty soon the results of documentaries um, that are probably being completed, you know, as as we're hosting this panel. So, Andrew, um, thanks everybody. That was that was. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. So I was going to say the the combination of documentaries is you know documentaries have been around for a long time. I think it's the combination of the storytelling but also the ability, ability for people to see documentaries more than ever. I mean, 10, 12 years ago, you had to have a theatrical release and then what would happen? And if not enough people went to see a documentary in a movie theater, you didn't get the, the audience. But here with streaming, with digital, with the number of different outlets that are going on, the ability for people to consume documentaries has grown tenfold over the last couple of years. And then you have the aspect of social media conversation between people to tell other people about it. It has just exploded in a way that um, people are, are consuming it. And really, to, Donald, to your point, and other people's point about how it's long, it's, it's really detailed storytelling. People are now engaging in docs like never before. So it's great to see both the story and the distribution come together to expand uh, the, you know, the documentary form. Thanks. Uh, I also just say really quickly that I think there's a whole new generation of people that have grown up on digital documentary too, and are so used to that being the medium now with which they're both entertained and get information. You know, just um, the last decade, we had all the digital media companies, whether it was Vice or Vox, coming up with really high end short form docs that conditioned you know, millennials really to take that in. And I think we're, it's a big piece of why we're seeing now today that people look to documentaries for the source of, um, of what's going on in the world and how they should respond to it. So I think it's, to Darnell's point, we like, I, I'm very bullish on documentary and where it's going for the future. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> so, hey, a Adam, um... Understanding that you're very active at the Ghetto Film School there in, in New York City or on the board, I'm just curious uh, if there's any kind of a segue with regard to the mission 
uh, th that's there at the school and how kids are engaged in storytelling and production and um, do they utilize documentaries, so to speak, as sort of a format that they're using to, to tell their, their stories or? So, um, you know, what's interesting about the ghetto film school is actually they shy away from documentary, you know, because the idea is when you're making something scripted, it's about pulling together disparate uh, groups. It's about a, amount of serious planning. It's about uh, focusing on a singular vision of a director and everyone supporting that vision. And so what they didn't want is just kind of people taking cameras home into their own neighborhoods and just into that dock. Now, on the other hand, I also support the Albert Maisel Center um, in Harlem. It does a great job with nonfiction stuff. But I think what I've seen in terms of, um, you know, what's, what's important to remember is, is that we need to work on the pipeline all the way through. So, you know, the Ghetto Film School is really focused on high school kids. That's where it started. And then, you know, a good dozen years after working there, we realized like, all right, well, like, how are we helping the early career people get going? Because it's one of the hardest industries to break into is figuring out how in entertainment to pay your bills and make art and do stuff. And so, you know, the Ghetto Film School expanded to have something called the roster, which helps, you know, create opportunities and connect, um, you know, funding and whatever else needed mentorship for people in early career. Because if you look at people, most people don't even get their careers going until they're in their early 30s, you know, or really break through into that first level. And so, you know, I think what's been interesting about the Ghetto Film School is they've now expanded. They have a great program in LA. They have a program in London. Um, and they're finding incredible, uh, you know, partners across all parts of film. I think it's the other thing is that when kids are 15 or 16, they all want to be directors. Mm -hmm. And there's a large learning curve to, to see how many other jobs exist in the industry, how many other things that have previously just been walled off, you know, in terms of that. So I think the pipeline thing is very important. At ESPN and Disney, um, we've seen already uh, a lot of directives come down, both from ESPN and Disney, um, making sure, you know, things like, every single meeting we have must have representation and not just one person, you know? Um, you know, any list of talent, you know, while I think a lot of people would, you know, throw on one or two, you know, and make sure there's a, a representation of people of color or black people, it's like, you can't do that. That's not the way to do it. And, and bringing forth a much larger uh, group of people and spending more time uh, watching more films of other people and bringing those into the forefront. So. I think, and then from the top, it's like in our senior management at ESPN, there's not enough black people at, at the table. And so what I'm seeing is like an overall stretch that can't be solved with just one part of that equation. Uh, you can't just add more people to a board of directors or give more funding to a high school program that exists, but that in fact, you must bolster all parts of the pipeline because at any point it can kind of break down and, uh, and work, you know, again, it takes so long to break into, um, you know, break in entertainment that if you're not supporting people much further along than just high school or college programs, you're going to be in trouble. So mm -hmm. while we're on that subject um, of emerging filmmakers, what kind of effect do you think having to go virtual this year will have not only on boutique film festivals like GIF, but also on market festivals like Toronto and Sundance. Do you think filmmakers are going to be reluctant to submit their films because of piracy issues? I know Andrew Carpin was very generous and very creative with how he was able to support nonprofits um, with some of his films that were supposed to be released theatrically. Um, but I was just curious about your thoughts on that. I think creators create, sorry, I was just jump in quickly, Andrew. I think creators create and they're looking, especially in the documentary scene, they really want their stuff to be seen. So I think, you know, certainly the top end who think they have a, a massive deal at a Hulu or an Apple, you know, might be more careful, I would say. But I think uh, most people are just trying to get their stuff out there. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, I, look, I, I do think the, um, there will be a short term issue in the sense like this. The number of films that a film festival is going to take, whether it's Toronto or Sundance or whatever, is going to probably be less because it's not going to be as big. And so that does create a problem because as Adam's saying, anytime a film gets into a 
major film festival, a local film festival, whatever it is, people are seeing that film. And that's how the process begins and you can expand. So there is going to be this concern of if fewer films are gonna be at, at local film festivals, if local film festivals don't even happen this year, how do, how do we make sure that content, um, that new content can get out there uh, to be seen uh, by audiences? So yeah, I do think there will be. And the other part of it is film festivals also help promote movies and, and promote documentaries and promote shows. And if people are not in a theater together having that conversation, how do we adjust accordingly for that? So these are, so, you know, I kind of look at it as short-term and long-term challenges. And though there are going to be some short-term challenges right now for 2020 uh, in terms of, you know, continuing to get content out there when we're wanting people to come back to, to whether it's the theater or other forms of, 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 of seeing content. Yeah, festivals are like incubators, yeah. you know, they protect the film, they show it to an audience, they promote it. If it, all of a sudden it goes digital, you're now competing against the biggest projects in the world, you know, that are just out there. And digital, it's like a flat landscape. So, you know, finding a way to, to, you know, as Andrew said, like that's where the word of mouth builds. That's where, you know, we see how audiences react to something and then companies tailor their, you know, acquisition strategies around that and find the right home for it. So I, I think it's hard to evaluate films purely from behind your computer. And I think if you take precious, especially documentaries where people commit you know, five, seven, 10 years of their lives to make something and then just dropping it in the, the void that is streaming and just hoping you'll gather people's attention. To me, that's, that's not a long-term solution either. I mean, look, the example I'll give is, 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 you know, we had a film at Sundance this past year called The Assistant, which, you know, dealt with workplace environment and it had a huge response at Sundance. We then opened it and, played in over 200 theaters, you know, around the country. And then, you know, when we went to digital, I think it was like number two on iTunes for like three straight weeks. It was that creating that buzz awareness that people could do. So I think we as distributors have to figure out how in the short term we're going to still create that buzz and awareness for new independent films. So Andrew, just to expand upon that, um, Louisa Green from Avon Theater uh, submitted a question saying that they are seeing a new trend where um, a new documentary is going to be released for in-theater screening and streaming simultaneously to give people more opportunity to see the film and to generate more revenue for the distributor. Do you see this trend increasing? Um, that is a, that is a um, very um, Difficult question for the for the industry right now because I think everybody, uh, if if you read, there's this big challenge of keeping the theatrical window uh, somewhat whole before streaming. Um, I kind of come from the perspective that we can't assume one size fits everything right now. I think that that for bigger films, I, I believe in the theatrical window. I believe giving that window before home entertainment and television. I do think there are going to be um, smaller films where it gives an opportunity for more people to see it. If you have a very small film that plays in 30 theaters around the country and doesn't get to most markets, having a, this virtual cinema where you can do it um, does add to that. However, it does take away from the communal experience of people being in a theater. I mean, one of the things I love, especially on independent film, is when you come out of a movie and people are having a debate, a discussion, or, you know, yeah, 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 I believe this, I, I saw it that way. That's part of what I love about the theatrical experience. And some of that gets lost in the, in the virtual side. Um, but we'll have to see whether that is a short term right now or when all theaters open again, how that's gonna play out. Uh, we did have another question that came through the, the Q&A feature, so I just want to make sure um, we're, we're answering a few of these. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee who says, Rodney King's uh, beating was a video. The conversation has been taking place in the Black community for a very long time. Black film, Black actors, and Black producers need to be a priority in film production. Um, if voices are not seen, we will not be ta talk. We will be talking about this forever. What are the real implications of money generating films versus what films are being made? So I think the question revolves around, 
you know, what are the implications if, if there's not the funding or where are they going to get the funding? I think that's how I'm interpreting it, um, uh, to make those important films that need to be made. And I'm not sure who, I don't know, uh, Darnell or who would be best I mean, to- I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in on, uh, on, on a bit of it. I'm, I'm not an expert in, in financing of, uh, of, of content, but I will say the important piece about like the system and structures of the you know studio system and networks have been you know there's like this myth that you know black films or black projects don't travel internationally um, you know there's only like limited windows and pockets where you can put certain certain films in and then there's been you know a number of projects I think over the last couple of years that have kind of debunked that myth because folks have actually put their neck out and and and, and tried it and, and tested it and so when you think that a certain film might not make money because of all these reasons that we've, we've created uh, based on based on race, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you just don't take the risk. Or when you do, you put it out in kind of a half-assed way and it's like, see, it didn't really work. But it's like, well, you didn't give it the same marketing budget and the same uh, push that you did a film that has majority white um, you know, uh, folks in, involved in it. So there's an example that I give and it's not a film example, but it is, you know, kind of a similar, um, you know, ideology is, so I represent a, a guy named Edward Innenfall, who is the editor in chief of British Vogue. Uh, and he became, he's, he's Ghanaian born, uh, raised in, in the UK, and, you know, has a really lengthy career in, in fashion, uh, and has become really an influential cultural voice. And so when British Vogue picked him to be their editor in chief, the first black editor in chief of, in the magazine's 102 year history, it was just kind of this interesting dynamic of how he approached it. One, let's be honest, the magazine world and fashion magazines are all kind of on the decline from a business perspective. And so what he did was bring his, his perspective to the table. Um, to his predecessor, when she left, took a picture of her staff uh, when she was leaving as a, as a good, got, goodbye picture, and it was all white women. And, you know, there was a lot of backlash for that. And, you know, and if you look at Edward's staff now, it is kind of this beautiful mosaic of all the people who, you know, represent not only Britain, but the world. Um, and, you know, when I asked him, like, well, how did you, you know, because like, what I hear is folks are like, oh, so hard to find people. And he's like, well, you've got to look in different places. You know, you can't look in the same places that you find white folks and say, oh, there's not enough black people here, so we try. He's like, we brought people in from different industries. We brought people in who always had an interest in fashion, but never thought they could get into this space, and we brought them in. And now they've become, you know, our most productive uh, colleagues. And then with the magazine itself, you know, the, the issue was, oh, well, you can't put a black woman on the cover of the September issue of, of a Vogue. It just won't sell. So his first September issue, he put Rihanna on the cover and it became their best selling issue in 20 years. The next year he teamed up with Meghan Markle and you know they did this, they put 15 different women on the cover who are of all shapes, sizes, colors, abilities, and it became their fastest issue, selling issue of all time. Um, the revenue of the, of the magazine is up 14% when every other magazine is down. And the reason is the business case, go figure, if you include more people and they see themselves as a part of, of, part of the project, then you've, you've increased the market. So now there are more people who are buying into British Vogue who, who never did before, and they're making more money. I think the same philosophy can be brought into film. There's so many studies that have been done now. I mean, that excuse should be gone because there's so many studies that have been done now. Um, you know, films who have 30%, you know, non-white cast, people of color, black people, perform better than ones that, that, don't, meet the, that don't meet that number, 30% or more. Same with, uh, same with TV projects. So, you know, there's a reason why those excuses were made. There, there is systematic racism in every one of our structures and whether it is on purpose or overt and people know about it or seemingly people have been falling into that system. So when we're, folks are talking about systematic change, it is re-looking at how do we allocate our dollars? Who do we hire? What, who's in the room? And also too, like if the moral argument isn't the thing that drives you to do the right thing, the business argument is, which usually drives people, is there too. And both of these things kind of converge in a beautiful way. So there's no excuse not to be actually making the effort because you're actually leaving money on the table. Um, so Darnell, why don't you keep going, man? I mean, what does diversity in media and entertainment look like to you? I mean, look, it, it, it's got a long, long way to go on in, in every aspect of it. So, you know, I sit in a, in, a, in a piece of the business where I'm looking at culture in general. So that the kind of 10 areas of, of culture that, that I look at are media, entertainment, sports, music, art, fashion, uh, you know, social impact, politics, health and wellness, 
um, and then kind of business and entrepreneurship all in one. Those are all the main drivers of what make up our social culture. And if you look at every one of those aspects, you know, they are so underrepresented of, of black people and, and people of color. And in many of those uh, areas, the people who are, who are driving and pushing the industry and who are building culture are black and brown artists. You know, the number one music genre in the world is hip hop. And it's pop music now. Everyone's listening to it. And, you know, so when, when, you, when you look at some of, you know, the most interesting fashion trends, when you look at some of the, the you know, the most groundbreaking artists right now, when you look at the most, you know, the, the best athletes, I mean, there's all these, there's all of these different factors of people that have made money on the backs of, uh, you know, of black culture, but they haven't invested in it. They haven't, you know, they haven't really cared about it. But when it does pop, they're, they're fine taking from it, but they haven't put back in. And so, you know, I'm glad that this moment is really shining that light. And look, I think what's different about this moment is for the first time I've seen, maybe not for the first time, the first time in mass, I've seen white executives um, really interested in figuring out a solution and actually really being engaged in, in doing it, which is a good thing. And I think that is that tipping point moment. So now that we have everyone's attention, it's like, how do we drive this change and, and, and move it and push it quickly? And I think there's been a lot of people working on these issues. So folks are ready to go with the information and the education and the, the lessons that need, need to be learned. Um, and, but, you know, I do think it is about investing in people at a young age and cre creating that pipeline. But I think there's also people who have been doing this for a very long time, who haven't gotten the attention, whose voices haven't been heard, who are out there that you should go out and find and bring them into, because I think they have a lot of value to add. Thank you, sir. We um, got a, um, another question in that uh, I think this is for Brent um, or, or Adam could probably speak to this too. Do you find that the projects currently on hold will need to be significantly revamped or perhaps canceled altogether before recommencing? Or is it just a matter of adding extra security safety measures to the budget? Um, that's from Jason. This is in reference to COVID, I take it, right? Yeah, I think, yes, from the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, uh, it, it has been interesting to watch Adam's shows, um, you know, be the most talked about things out there right now. Um, and, you know, it, it, it does provide yet a moment, I think, for these documentaries to, you know, be heavily, to be finished because they're so heavy in post-production. Um, or you can shoot a single interview without a, a big crew. Um, you know, like ESPN, we do shows of all shapes and sizes. And what, what is, you know, we've got a lot of production that we're trying to tee up that'll happen in places like Iceland or, or other spots that are, you know, in, in, a, in a sort of different um, sort of temperature zone around COVID and everything that's happening. I, I mean, for, for us, it's been a soul searching moment to do more stuff that we don't rely on other people for. And by that, I mean, um, we, we were very fortunate today to announce a partnership with um, uh, Kevin Hart. And what, what drew us, or one of the things that drew us to Kevin was, you know, his direct relationship with an audience. And, you know, we're so focused now on all these young kids who move culture of all colors and, and, and their direct relationship, whether they're TikTok or Instagram stars. I think people are, you know, going back through this conversation, people are really really wanting authenticity from whoever it is. So you, when you see a, you know, an A-list actor like Will Smith reinvent himself um, as, a, as a YouTube and social star because he let people in to who he and, and in his case is very talented family are. Um, so the, the, it is, my, my, one of my colleagues said it's best. We're, we're, when it comes to COVID, uh, we need to take you know, it's basically like taking every, for every step forward, there's like five X trying to get there. And the networks um, and the producers are struggling with who ultimately carries the cost of a shutdown. Um, and, and so insurance becomes uh, the key driver in production, which it historically hasn't been uh, usually that, that front of a seat. Um, and so, you know, right now we're working with various platforms, streamers and networks to understand what is the actual cost? In some cases, smaller crews could save money, um, but then security and other measures are super, super important. So it's, it, we haven't been able to shoot um, the vast bulk of our stuff yet, but we're getting closer and closer and closer on most of it. 
Hey, Brent, if I follow up on that, you know, in terms of your crew size, if you're cutting down, you know, folks to, uh, as, as one of the impacts of dealing with COVID, are you also saying that you're having to build new types of personnel into your specifically there are just take care of things like cleanliness, um, issues, et cetera, et cetera. And what is that doing to your cost as well? Yeah, the, 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 the phrase deep clean uh, has new meaning. Um, it's a good time to be in the cleaning business. Uh, yeah, there, you know, the state, as you know better than me, George, dictates a lot of it. Um, but there's kind of like what the state says and then what, what our employees are really, you know, comfortable doing. So we're, we're really opening it up to employees for the ones who um, want to come in and, and get back to work first to ha have them be at the forefront of it, but really going down um, to, to the level of, all right, do we need sort of a pandemic um, operative to be on every production to make sure it's a safe environment from that standpoint? I know in Hollywood, it's, it's so much about the actors being the only one without mask on. Um, are they quarantining entire crews? Um, are they letting you know some of the crews go back on weekends? Um, it is. It is. A, it, this is the, the area where I'm telling my guys we don't have to be first. <laughs> Let's just really try to watch what other people are doing and and test the temperature because ultimately, if our employees don't feel like we're looking out for their best um, uh, their best interests, then they're gonna you know our great employees are gonna leave to go elsewhere. So. It's listening to the government and then trying to be as safe and in some cases safer than what's being mandated. Yeah, and just as a, an aside, you know, it's not all, all about us. You know, we are working really hard with folks like the Motion Picture Association who've come out with a white paper and the, the unions and the producers and the directors of the guild, they're really having, you know, a lot of input in terms of what they expect to see you know, from set to set, that would, that would be uh, um, sort of Yeah, and I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think all you guys and all, almost everybody out there right now has worked harder than, than they've ever worked. And there's a lot of, you know, best guessing going on. And then we get in and we, you know, into practical use and we'll tweak it and it'll change. And, and what's, you know, it, it, nobody was opening brown boxes, you know, 40 days ago. Um, so I think people will kind of, get to a spot where it's it's different than it is right now, but it's a lot of work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say that just in July is gonna be obviously a huge month and in some ways sports is leading that charge, you know. Uh, MLS returns uh, first, I think. We've already seen UFC and top rank uh, boxing and, and, and fighting return. And then to be honest, I really think everybody follows the NBA. So, you know, how the NBA pulls off that quarantine situation just the amount of people and just the date on which it's looking to start, which is the end of July. I think that will dictate lots of stuff in the fall, both in sports and outside of sports in terms of protocols and, and what worked. I think it's just a, a large test and experiment that they're, they're really working through. We, we had another question come in just. Um... Hey, um, Ginger, can I just let Andrew follow up on that before we do the next person? Andrew, what do you, what do you see some of these COVID-19 production, incremental production costs? Do you think that's going to be something that's significant that you have to pay attention to when you're evaluating whether or not you're going to pick up a film? Um, yeah, I think uh, um, in addition to what uh, Brian Adam was saying, there are some costs, especially on some of the bigger films or even small films that I work on in terms of somebody there on set specializing or being your, your the, the, the COVID person to make sure things are going well. You're going to have to change shooting times and the length of day. So there are going to be impacts. The other big problem right now, um, and I wasn't sure if someone mentioned it, is for independent film is the insurance aspect. Because here's the business thing. Right now, COVID's not going to be covered by, by insurance. So if you start a film and it stops shooting, whoever the financier is, is, is gonna have a big problem. And so there's so, no such thing as a completion bond anymore. <laughs> that's the problem, you're not right. And so that is having a problem for non-studio films right now on the want to start up again, the desire to start up. And again, here's the other thing that's going on is, you know, a lot of actors, uh, not just you know, the actors, the DPs, everybody associated with films had like three or four films in a row that they were ready to shoot. 
this whole thing has gotten backlogged. And so the question is, okay, am I gonna do the one that I was supposed to do? But if they can't get their financing together, where do I go here? What is less risky? What is more risky? So all of these things are, uh, are coming into play right now on both what's gonna shoot, how we're gonna shoot, and the cost of shooting. Right on, thanks. Sorry, Ginger, if you wanna do- No, and, and actually it segues nicely into the question. Um, Josh Leong uh, asks, is it true that the industry has recently shifted to development in the absence of production? What are companies like Bleecker Street, UTA and ESPN doing to find or incubate new film scripts and talent during this unique time? Uh, I don't, it's interesting on the development and production, I don't think we've done anything different because the development aspect is still reading scripts, trying to find a project we want to do. That's the actually, the, that's the one thing that actually can be done now. You can get everything ready right before to shoot. So um, I, I don't think that has changed much for us. We're still getting uh, tons of scripts in and my acquisition team and development team are, are reading a lot. So that part of the business hasn't, it's nicely one part, hasn't changed that much. I mean, I don't know about the rest of you guys. Yeah, I mean, for us uh, on the film side, our 30 for 30 films are primarily historical based and archival based. So um, we're trying to, you know, really lean into that um, and find stories that, you know, uh, rely on, on a lot of post and, and archival for the most part, plus, plus interviews. Yeah, we, we spoke at the top of this as a senior team to our teams that, we're not going to be selling as much and we're not going to be making as much obviously during this. So let's do more self-development and have a, a slate that is profound coming out of COVID. And I think it's been a really interesting opportunity because it's been able, we've been able to get to huge talent, not just once, but over COVID and develop these relationships that, you know, um, are, are, are more in some ways more intimate. I mean, we're, we're sitting here in many, people's bedrooms and living rooms. And, 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 and it's been such a, I think, fantastic, creatively inspiring time um, because, you know, chaos creates opportunity and forces, um, you know, uh, solutions. And, and so I think in some ways it's been a super, it's been amazing to focus on development as much as we've been able to, because to, to Andrew's point, it's usually just one out of four or five things we have to focus on at once. Nice. Uh, yeah. Thank you to everybody. I think we have two or maybe 10 panels just all in, in one right now because there's so much going on in our world. But um, I think it is, it's hard to say it's an exciting time, but um, for the entertainment industry in general, I know the film festival, one of the main pillars of why we founded the film festival was to use film as a tool for education. And I think now more than ever, um, that's kind of coming together. I mean, we, we had a panel with uh, Peter Gabriel's Witness, which he founded in 1989. Um, to film human rights violations for just regular people to film human rights violations. And so I think there've been kind of starts and stops with um, how the industry has uh, built off cultural mo movements. And I'm just hopeful that uh, we'll actually move in a um, incredibly important direction and, and kind of be leaders in that. So thank you all. And we got to thank you, Darnell, for what you've contributed um, from a black woman who has worked in film and television for over 30 years. The racism and sexism still exists, but she's very hopeful that positive changes like you discussed will um, happen. Do you, do you want to read a couple more, Ginger? Or? Um, no, I think we covered some of the, the main themes coming through. Um, sorry, I just, with it, tied to what you were speaking about, um, we brought it up. All right, no, 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 no cool. Um, so, Brent, um, do you mind sharing sort of what you might have uh, to share with us uh, on the screen at some point that might be new? Um, <clears throat> we, we have a documentary series um, on the Heaven's Gate um, uh, cult that, uh, you know, is a story that a lot of, uh, you know, people my age and older remember, but but it'll be diving deep into that, along with a documentary that we're doing on um, uh, uh, WeWork, which uh, which has been a fascinating um, rise and uh, stumble um, all at the same time. And then uh, uh, a feature called Compton Cowboys, 
which um, we have Prentice Penny and, and other extremely talented folks at the forefront of doing, which we think and hope will you know, be one of these films that highlights sort of the things we've talked about here that can affect change. It's about a group of um, uh, young black men who decided in Compton to, to put their energy and focus on raising horses um, as a means to, to staying out of trouble. And uh, it's, a real, it's a real true uh, story started by an incredible woman a few decades ago. And, and so as I'm learning it was, as part of my first feature, these things take a long time, but, uh, but it's all trending in the right direction. Roger that, thank you. Andrew, do you wanna shine a light on anything you might uh, have coming out in the near future? Um, sure, well, fingers crossed. Uh, we have a movie dated for July 24th uh, called Save Yourselves, which um, kind of is, uh, we picked up at Sundance, which is a sh uh, strange story about two 30 something year olds in Brooklyn who decide to go offline, get rid of their computer or their phone or then go up to the, the country for a week. And while they're off, um, the world is invaded by aliens. So, uh, and what happens with the world? So it's kind of this crazy comedy that I think would be perfect for uh, for this time. Uh, in September, we have an interesting film uh, called The Secrets We Keep um, with Numi Rapace and Joel Kinnerman about a woman um, post-World War II living in a small American town. And um, she believes that um, she hears a whistle and she believes that person she's hearing who is in her small town was a um, Nazi uh, person who attacked her family during the war and uh, she kidnaps him. And what does she do? Is it, is it him? Is it not him? What does she do? But because she has him now in her house. So we have those two. And then the final one, which was the film that we were going to share with uh, the Greenwich Film Festival, which was supposed to come out in May. It's a film called Dream Horse with Tony Collette and um, oh my God, uh, Damien Lewis, which is the true life story of a Welsh, a group of uh, Welsh town that got together and bred a racehorse that actually became one of the winningest racehorses in uh, uh, in Welsh in, in Welsh won and wins some races. Just this group of people coming together, um, participating in a sport that's not normally for the the local townspeople and how they come together. And again, I kind of feel the right kind of film for right now. So hopefully that will come out in the fall as well uh, with theaters opening. Sounds like a great slate. Adam? Uh, we moved up every 30 for 30 that we had in the, in the hopper to come after last <laughs> dance. So we had a two-part Lance Armstrong. We had our Bruce Lee film and our Long Gone Summer of McGuire Sosa. That is all that we have. That was supposed to last us the full year. So we're gonna go dark until Super Bowl time. We got, uh, but we got a whole slate. We got uh, nine films in production uh, in various stages. So we are looking now at projects for 2022 and 2023. Um, and um, but you know we're hoping that now it'll be time for live sports to carry the burden for a little while for ESPN. <laughs> well, Adam, I thank you for for moving all those up because I've watched all of them. So I want to thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Thalia, would you like to uh, share what you might have coming out of the hopper soon? Sure, sure. We're, well, some of it I, we haven't officially announced, so I can tell you approximately what we're working on, which is a doc series on female, uh, limited doc series on female sexuality. Um, and uh, the, one of the major streamers, hopefully we'll announce that soon. Um, we are working on an investigative doc series um, on sexual abuse, heavy topics. Um, we have a short film that we're working on with Red Bull Media on one of the a star, one of their star athletes. There's um, oh, we were a, a documentary on another cult right down the street from Heaven's Gate, <laughs> right next door. Um, that was that we're excited about, um, Venarius. Uh, so that's in the works as well, and then. Um, we're in post on that and another film called Voice Through the Storm about the island of St. Thomas. And um, it, it was kind of the week between that got hit by two um, Category 5 hurricanes and a single person who was the radio host who, while all communications were down, 
was the person that was able to unite the whole island and help them work through that um, really difficult time where the government um, forgot about a whole little island that existed. So yeah, quite a few things. And, and again, yeah, thankfully it's been, and we're excited about, you know, to Brett's, Brent's point, this has been a great time to really kind of create our wish list of, all right, what could we be working on in 2021? And let's get that together and start pitching that out, you know? So, um, so a lot of, uh, and a lot of reaching out to talent and a lot of um, creating relationships, both on the, on the, with different filmmakers and with buyers and, um, and with um, talent, uh, classic talent actors and that kind of stuff. So I think it's just, it's been a time of building in a lot of ways, building relationships and connecting with the industry in a way that I haven't really felt before. So I found that to be a nice consolation prize. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like um, everybody is is working on, you know, I'm very looking forward to it. And Darnell, I don't want to leave you out. I know that you you work at a, at a talent agency, um, which is where they actually package the films, and determine the above the line, and do all of that kind of you know top secret behind the scenes important work. Um, is there anything that um, that you have your fingers on that you can talk about that you wouldn't have to kill us? Yeah, if you told no, us? we've got you know the good news is as an agency we have a lot of projects that are that are going on and that are being great, greenlit and being announced. You know. One that I will, will say that I helped package and work very closely on, which I mentioned earlier that we announced last Thursday, is this um, uh, this documentary on, on voting rights that Stacey Abrams is producing and others. And the reason why that one is, I mean, one, before I got into the entertainment business, you know, my background was in, in politics. I've always cared about uh, po political issues. But I think if you look at what's going on right now around issues with voting, uh, I think Georgia's primary a couple of weeks ago was a classic example of it. Um, and there's so many things in this documentary that talk about how, you know, suppression efforts are manifesting themselves today. And a lot of people try to act like it's not happening. And this gives like the real detailed look. I think tomorrow you're going to see in Kentucky a real disaster um, because uh, Kentucky used COVID as an excuse to close um, 3,500 polling stations. And, um, and their largest, uh, the, the largest population uh, of, of Louisville 616,000 uh, people, there's one polling location, and that's also to where over 50% of the state's black population is. So, you know, I think the, the film is is very important of breaking down, um, you know, and, and letting us see what's what's happening and what's going on, and hopefully doing it at a point, um, it comes out in September, um, it'll, there'll be a theatrical uh, September 11th, and then it'll be on Amazon um, uh, a week later. Uh, but, you know, obviously going into perhaps the most consequential election of our, our lifetimes, we'd hopefully like to get our voting system straight. So uh, I think it'll be important. I think it'll be timely and hopefully we'll drive a lot of good conversation. Yeah. Well, I asked. <clears throat> um, well, I, we're coming to kind of an end point uh, in terms of our timing allocated for the panel. And I know all the panelists are extremely busy also, but um, on behalf of Greenwich International Film Festival and Wendy, Colleen, and I, we want to thank um, Fairfield County Look for hosting the platform today. Um, we want to thank the Connecticut Office of Film um, and Television and Digital Media, and especially George Norfleet for being part of this. Um, also, thank you to Adam, Brent, Darnell, Andrew, and Thalia for serving as panelists. Um, it, it was wonderful that during all of this craziness, you could take time out of your day to share your thoughts and expertise. Um, I think the discussion was wonderful and covered um, many of the issues that we faced in the last six months. So I do want to mention Fairfield County Look will be sending out a thank you note to all of the participants um, and people who had RSVP'd for this event. Uh, that will include the recording um, of the panel today in case anyone missed any part of it. Uh, they'll also be sharing it with their broader audience. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ginger. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. nice to meet everybody. Nice to bye. meet everyone. Bye. Talk to you later, Brent. Yeah, bye, George. Bye. bye.